Believe it or not, only one company in the entire world makes basically all of our chips, and it's not TSMC, Intel, or Samsung. This mysterious four-letter company have a complete monopoly on the chip fabrication industry, and their latest design only pushes that monopoly further. And yet, they're owned by their own customers. Their most recent machines are larger than a double-decker bus, but can spit out 185 300 mm wafers per hour, 24-7, 365 days a year. This is the history of ASML. To understand how we got to these warehouse-sized machines, we first have to understand how chips have been made throughout the last half century or so. Semiconductor manufacturing, and transistors in particular, which are the foundation of all integrated circuits, dates back to the late 1940s. Surprisingly recent, isn't it? Three guys from Bell Labs, because of course it was Bell Labs, they seem to have either accidentally or on purpose created the basis for everything that we use today. Uh, William Shockley, Walter Brattan, and John Bardeen created the first transistor. It wasn't what you would call micro, but it worked and proved the concept. Unsurprisingly, another group at Bell Labs made another accidental discovery. They accidentally grew a layer of silicon dioxide across a wafer, a silicon wafer, which they quickly worked out you could use as a mask to imprint designs in the silicon below. Just so you have an idea, silicon can be doped to be either P-type or N-type, and if you sandwich a bit of P or N between two of the opposite types, you create a channel and therefore a transistor. This style of transistor is called a planar transistor since, well, it's all on one plate. And if you take that and you're either Robert Noyce of Fairchild or Jack Kilby of Texas Instruments in 1958, you might suddenly realize that well, you can put all of that together and create integrated circuits and now spawn the industry we, well, now rely on. Amazingly, the two of them actually independently created the integrated circuit around the same time. The idea was pretty simple. Chain multiple transistors together to create functional logic. These designs were pretty simple, at least by modern standards, and we're still talking like near human eye visible feature sizes too. One key thing I mentioned there was the silicon wafers, the big expensive discs that the designs get etched into. Although to begin with, they weren't all that big. In 1960, when the first ICs were being built, you were looking at just a one inch wafer. You can't fit many chips onto that one. The way that those wafers are made is actually really cool too. Basically, you melt down pure silicon, introduce a seed crystal into that molten silicon, and then basically draw a big semiconducting sausage up called a bull. That bull is then sliced into discs, polished to be perfectly flat, and then sent off to be patterned. Those discs have gradually increased in size over the years. 1969 saw two inch wafers, which were 275 micrometers thick. 1972 brought three inch at 375 thick. Uh, and 1976, they basically settled on metric sizing with four inch, 100 mil uh, wafers, then 4.9 inch, 125 mil in uh, 81, 150 mil or six inch in uh, 83, 200 mil in our uh, eight inch wafers in 92, and 300 mil or 12 inch wafers in 1999. There has been a proposed 450 millimeter wafer standard for nearly two decades now, but due to the wafers being expected to be quadruple the cost of 300 millimeter wafers and that no fabrication machines currently support those wafers, well, the machine cost would have to go up considerably too, despite not actually cutting production costs all that much. So development of 450 millimeter wafers seems to be dead in the water. So you've got your wafer, but what do you actually put on it? Well, initially, as I said, the designs were relatively simple, and importantly, the designs all basically used just one of the two MOSFET types. 
MOSFET stands for Metal Oxide Semiconductor Field Effect Transistor, by the way, specifically N-Type, that was known as NMOS logic, and was the preeminent design choice. It wasn't exactly ideal though, limiting circuit designs and often having pretty poor power efficiency as there's still a bit of current leakage even in the off state. So Frank Wanless of Fairchild developed a phrase us PC nerds know well for actually a bit of a weird reason too, a design process called CMOS. You likely know the word thanks to the CMOS battery in your PC, which is what you call the BIOS chip battery, but CMOS is actually the chip design. Complementary metal oxide semiconductor designs use complementary transistors to create logic, i.e. both types of transistors. The trick here is that because one of the two transistors will always be off when the input signal is the same, the power consumption drops and you get better noise immunity. CMOS slowly became the standard, and functionally all chip designs are now CMOS. Even things like camera sensors are actually CMOS sensors. But like, how do you actually put those designs onto a wafer? Well, it turns out that we've been doing it the same way for the last half decade and a bit. Photolithography. The process is remarkably simple. You apply a coating to the wafer, and then use a mask to selectively harden the coating in the areas that you want to keep or remove, and then just chemically etch the unprotected areas away. The modern multi-layer method is slightly different, as you first deposit a thin layer of fresh silicon on top, then apply a resist, the coating that you just spin coat on top. You basically stick the wafer to a turntable, pour on the liquid resist, and spin the disc so that it evenly distributes that resist across the wafer. You pre-bake it to get it stable, and then you use your mask and some ultraviolet light to selectively harden normally the areas that you want to etch away. Then you use a developer solution to wash away the hardened areas, leaving the silicon layer below. You can then use chemical etching to strip away that silicon, effectively cutting your chip design into the wafer. You'll do what that, uh, what's called ion implantation to dope the different regions to create that P or N type areas and do any metal or more, um, more recently polycrystalline silicon deposition, the metal oxide part of the MOSFET. And then you will use a resist stripper to clean off the resist. You'll add a layer of silicon dioxide and flatten that out and then repeat that for however many layers you have and then etch the silicon dioxide away, and hey presto, you've got a design etched into your wafer. So if the process has remained functionally the same for the last 60 years, what has actually changed to let us go from 20 micrometer feature sizes in 1968 to two nanometers today? Well, First of all, just to be pedantic, especially in the last decade or so, that process node uh, sort of size doesn't act match the actual feature size of you know transistors or gates anymore. But in short, there is two main changes: thin feds and the light sources used for photolithography. You might have heard the term FinFET before, likely mostly from Intel, as their absolutely mental naming scheme for their process nodes included the term, even opting for SuperFET at one point, before reverting back to numbers, albeit still nonsensical numbers. But anyway, FinFET basically means that instead of the gate just being placed on top of the channel, the channel is actually a thin blade, a fin, if you will, and the gate wraps entirely around it. That means that you get much better control of the transistor with lower leakage, and you can essentially chain multiple fins together to control the current capacity and switching characteristics. All modern CPUs and GPUs use FinFETs instead of planar transistors, or at least similar concepts anyway. As for the light sources, that's actually really interesting. Originally, mercury lamps were used to do the selective hardening, which output 436 nanometer wavelength light. 
That is basically the sort of thing you find in resin 3D printers, at least give or take on the, the nanometer of the frequency, although they use LEDs, not mercury lamps, thank god. Later lamps produced shorter wavelengths at 365 nanometers, but between the fact that the feature sizes were getting to be, well, that size, and the need for higher throughputs, i.e. more wafers made faster, the industry was looking for a better alternative. 1982 brought about the solution from IBM, which was using an excimer laser. Excimer lasers use an inert gas and a reactive gas under high pressure and voltage to emit deep ultraviolet light, hence the, this process and class of machines being known as DUV. The two sort of most common lasers in DUV machines are KRF, Krypton fluoride, which outputs 248 nanometer light, and ARF, argon fluoride, which outputs 193 nanometer light. Amazingly, we've been able to use much larger wavelengths of light than the feature size, that 193 nanometer light can, in the right circumstances, go all the way down to 7 nanometer features. That's thanks in part to a whole bunch of really clever tricks, like immersing the wafer in pure water to change its index of refraction, allowing for higher numerical aperture lenses. We'll come back to what the hell all that means shortly, don't worry. This is also where ASML comes into the picture. ASML was a spin-off of Philips as ASM lithography in 1984. But after the introduction of the deep ultraviolet techniques, they started creating photolithography machines with their PAS5500 platform being their first big success. Initially, it did actually use the I-Line mercury lamps, the 365 nanometer ones, but was upgraded with KRF and ARF lasers too. They went public in 1988, and by 2002, they were the world's largest supplier of photolithography machines. In 1997, though, they started basically researching ways to create and utilize extreme ultraviolet light in the 10 to 30 nanometer range. To say that they were, there were challenges in creating these EUV machines would be a complete understatement. Extreme ultraviolet light like this is absorbed by almost anything, meaning that the whole system needs to be under vacuum. The mirrors that are used to direct and control the lights need to be extremely precise too, hence why Zeiss makes them. German precision and all that, right? These are the flattest surfaces in the world. And they need to be uh, to actually bounce the EUV lights rather than just absorb it. The most insane part, though, is how ASML actually makes the 13.5 nanometer light, though. See, it turns out that if you happen to explode a drop of molten tin with an extremely powerful laser, the resulting explosion happens to release 13.5 nanometer wavelength photons. Science man, it's like barbaric magic sometimes. It took ASML over a decade to make the first production machine, shipping a prototype in 20, uh, 2010 and evolving those designs over the 2010s. Interestingly, in 2012, ASML decided to offer 25% ownership of themselves to their biggest customers as part of their customer co-investment program, with Intel taking 15% for a total of $4.1 billion, including just under a billion in R&D funding. TSMC took another 5% and Samsung took 3%. Interestingly, Samsung eventually sold off their shares, supposedly netting an 8x return on their investment. Not bad, huh? As far as I'm aware, uh, both TSMC and Intel still own their shares in full. Although what's even more interesting to me is that Intel stuck with DUV until mid-2022, with Intel 4 being the first process node to use ASML's EUV machines. All of those 14 nanometer plus 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 nodes, the, the 10 nanometer nodes that never really came to fruition, all of that was with DUV. That's insane, and yet Intel have already started moving off of those EUV machines onto ASML's newest design, 
the high NA EUV machines. High NA or high numerical aperture, see, told you to come back to that, those machines capture more of the extreme ultraviolet light produced by vaporizing tin droplets. The more light you capture, the less exposure time is needed and the more detailed the designs can be. And importantly, you don't need to do multiple exposures for a given design anymore. That means that you can push out more wafers. ASML's latest TwinScan EXC 5000 system can do 185 wafers per hour or a little over 1.6 million wafers per year. It also has a resolution of just 8 nanometers for up to 2 nanometer process nodes. These machines do cost a pretty penny though, with a DUV machine costing anywhere between 5 and 90 million dollars, EUV being more like 220 million, and a high NA machine is a whopping 400 million dollars. And Intel has bought out their entire 2024 stock. These machines are larger than a double-decker bus, weigh more than a blue whale, and are under a total vacuum. These machines only further the SML's total monopoly on the EUV market, with no other suppliers existing at all. You might be wondering what's next. I mean, a silicon atom is 0.2 nanometers wide, so you can only shrink the feature size so far. And as you do, you also run into issues like electron migration, where the electrons can just jump over the increasingly small gap without being let through by the gaze. And it seems like the most common answer to this right now is at least increasingly being selected as gallium nitride, or GAN. You've likely heard of GAN in power electronics, like really efficient USB-C power bricks that can push out 100 watts or more of power in what would normally be a pretty toasty 50 or 60 watt brick. The main reason for that is that GAN transistors can switch much faster and convert less of that energy into heat. Those benefits might make their way into logic circuitry too, with HRL laboratories claiming to have made the first CMOS GAN transistors in 2016, theoretically proving or providing more efficient, possibly even faster clock speed chips. Well, kind of have to wait and see on that one though. So in short, ASML managed to take over the world of semiconductor manufacturing in just 40 years, and now with their new high NA machines are aiming to cement their place in all of our pockets and PCs for decades to come. Basically all of your chips are made with ASML's machines, be that DUV for the microcontrollers in your car, or EUV for your CPU and GPU, and yet they're a kind of understated Dutch brand that most people haven't heard of. It's kind of incredible, and my god, the fact that we make EUV light by exploding drops of tin, it's just, ah, oh, it's it, beautiful madness. <laughs> so that's a brief history of SML and of semiconductor manufacturing and photolithography. If you enjoy these sorts of videos, I'm increasingly enjoying making them too, learning more and being able to share that with you guys. Uh, feel free to check the other videos on the uh, end cards when they pop up in a second and hit the subscribe button for more like this one. If you want to see the more regular reviews, those should also be on the end cards and there's plenty up on the channel too. And otherwise, if you have any questions, if I got anything wrong because I am human and an idiot, feel free to let me know in the comments down below or if there's any other context and stuff you think people should know of please do leave that in the comments down below as well. And otherwise, yeah, if you want to check out my own uh, hardware, the uh, actually probably also made with ASML's machines, um, check out osrtt.com uh, for the open source just one time and latency testing tools. And otherwise, thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you all in the next video.